First Prince Paul Davian had spent the initial three years of his reign overhauling his government, his military, and his intelligence networks. The Reformation, as this turbulent time had become known, came to an end in February 2801, after which Davian began making preparations for a serious counter-offensive against the rampaging Draconis Combine. The resurgent armed forces of the Federated Sons had already won a number of minor victories through random strikes along the front, but Paul developed a more cohesive strategy for them to follow. While he would take to the field to inspire his soldiers to greater heroism, command of the actual ground operations mostly fell to his uncle, Thomas Holder Davian. That February, the AWFS left Logandale and headed for their first target, Kintari IV. With them were the 7th Crucis Lancers, who sought to avenge the massacre that had happened on their watch. When they arrived, they found the DCMS garrison in disarray. For the past four years, a small guerrilla force left behind during the initial evacuation had been making their lives hell. The arrival of several Davian regiments promptly ended the fighting that April. Reclaiming such a symbolic world did wonders for Paul's reputation within the Fed Sons. To reward his efforts, the First Prince elevated Colonel Alexander Dressari to the position of Duke of Kintari. On the opposite side of the Inner Sphere, the LCAF were again intensifying their raids within the Bolan Thumb and seized the relatively undefended Hertzberg system in July. The mood along the Kiritin Theatre was decidedly less hopeful, as the Dragon had claimed another four systems and destroyed one of their regiments in the process. The Combine could not celebrate these victories, as the AWFS continued to roll forward throughout the year. Even before Kantari fell, Davian forces moved on to secondary targets in March. The last was secured in November, but by this point another wave had been launched the previous month. Another six of their conquests were liberated by year's end. 2802 followed more or less the same pattern. Each victory boosted the morale of the AWFS and damaged that of the DCMS. Jinjiro Kirita resorted to ever more brutal disciplinary actions on his failing commands, but this only cemented their unwillingness to fight. Many officers were so ashamed by how easily they were defeated that they chose to commit seppuku. Those that didn't were interrogated by their captors. Reports from the front were now flowing smoothly back to the Davian intelligence agencies providing them with further information on Kiritan deployments. This allowed their scarce naval assets to isolate the worlds with the heaviest garrisons and strike where the line was weakest. Another six worlds were liberated in 2802, and they were making landfall on four more by year's end. The Woodbine operational area was now totally back under their control. The Draconis Combine was also suffering attacks from the Capellan Confederation. Ronald was apprised that Liao did not wish to give up so easily and made several attempts to reclaim it during the first five years of the 29th century. They were somewhat troubled to find that elements of the Ariana Grenadiers left behind after their initial loss had come together to form a mercenary battalion fighting for Kirita. The Combine struck back by launching an attack on Lincoln. Elements of the Northmen Highlanders on Weld were still recuperating from repelling a Marrick assault on Zion, a battle that saw them destroy rival mercenary regiment Gladstone's Gladiators. Seeing off Damien's destroyers and their regular support proved a greater challenge, one that continued into the new year. In 2802, the Lyrans reclaimed two of the systems lost to House Marrick during the first years of the war. Both had been heavily scarred by the use of WMDs during the initial invasion. With their loss, the Free World's foothold within the Ilarian province became extremely tenuous. 2802 was also a landmark year for Comstar. In March, they announced that for the first time, the organization was no longer in the red. Jerome Blake's decision to chase profits had come at the expense of several systems, however. Comstar had prioritized whatever worlds were most likely to bring in revenue, either through their population or their strategic position. Several systems within the former hegemony had been largely abandoned, unable to call in aid or supplies. The periphery especially, whom Blake held personally responsible for the Star League Civil War, 
was particularly hard hit. Nevertheless, approximately 40% of the inner sphere was now serviced by a Comstar HBG, and the number of hyperpulse generators would continue to grow even as the succession wars raged around them. The Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth were once again the only factions making moves in 2803. The AFFS was still riding the wave, securing their winter conquests and then taking four more systems in the summer, before launching yet another pair of invasions by year's end. The Leiden conquests within the Bolan Thumb that year would prove to be the last of Hasseldorf's private campaign. Significant use of weapons of mass destruction or Malazan meant very few of the FWLM forces on world escaped to reinforce their compatriots on a crux. Like Rocher before it, the devastation was so great that Steiner ultimately decided the colony was a lost cause, ceding the wasteland back to the League. The defenders on Finsterwalde were quick to resort to the same tactics, only this time the results were far more costly for the LCAF. When the Lyran guards touched down, they were hit by successive WMD strikes, obliterating the regiment. Worse, the last of the corvettes the Commandant General had access to were hit by aerospace fighter-launched nuclear missiles. With no means to escort his units to their next destination, the Archon ordered Hasseldorf to call off his offensive. For his successes, he was made a Baron of Kaunberg and promoted to General. How Steiner formally declared a victory over the Free Worlds League and considered the Bolan Thumb to be reclaimed by the Lyran Commonwealth. The last few Maddox holdouts were in an untenable position and would surely wither on the vine. Elsewhere in the realm, the pirates known as Cameron's Curse, once Amaris regulars who had deserted their emperor as Kerensky closed on Terra, accepted a contract with Haus Steiner as the rebranded Raymond's Redcoats. Turning his attention towards his other opponent, Steiner ordered a raid against the former Terran hegemony provincial capital of Lone Star. Their primary targets were the atmospheric processors that allowed the planet to maintain a breathable atmosphere, themselves only a necessity after an earlier Kiritan bioweapon was unleashed in an effort to make the population capitulate. This led to a terminal environmental collapse, and with civilian jumpships now a rarity, eventually the starvation and death of tens or perhaps even hundreds of millions on world. Elsewhere in the ruins of the hegemony, a Draconis Combine salvage team arrived at the dead world of Inglesmond, tomb to more than 4 billion individuals. Despite Comstar reports that there were no survivors, they were shocked to find that one of the continents housed a large group of survivors, numbering around 1 million. Initial efforts to steal anything of value met with resistance from a battalion of mechs taken from an SLDF supply cache. As if in rejection of the native population's incredible determination to survive, the Combine again unleashed their strategic arsenal and finished what their predecessors started. One final tragedy in the planet's sad legacy. On January 19th, 2804, Captain General Kenyon Maddock suffered a fatal heart attack. The Free World's Parliament called a session to discuss who would become the next Captain General. While the Eagles' campaign against the Capellan Confederation had been fantastically successful, in the last decade of his life, the exhausted military had been unable to make much progress, taking only Christiansund from the Tikhonov Lancers in the previous three years. His sole surviving descendant, Thaddeus, had proven himself unable to score many victories against the Lyran Commonwealth. At the time of his father's death, he was busy launching another attack on Alhina. Resolution 288 had given Kenyon supreme authority within the League, but his death meant the Marek family was no longer in control. Thaddeus's campaign on Alhina concluded just three days later, at which point he immediately departed for Atreus to stake his claim. Unfortunately, his flagship suffered a jump drive malfunction en route, stranding the Madakair at Rasalus until alternate transportation could be found. When he finally made it back to the capital in July, he found Parliament was ready to remove him from power. Thaddeus argued that because his father had never renounced Resolution 288, and since the First Succession War was still raging, the law was clearly still in effect. 
As his heir, he was entitled to all the powers Kenyon had wielded. The ministers were unconvinced, and two-thirds of them decided to walk out in protest, only to come face to face with a company of loyal Marek battlemechs. With a gun pointed to their head, most returned to their seats in order to affirm Thaddeus as Captain General. The following month, the Grand Duke of Orient Carter Allison and his allies from the Duchy of Orloff arrived on Atreus to have their say. They were vehemently opposed to the blatant political bullying and would not give Thaddeus their support. Marek had nevertheless achieved sufficient backing to become the new head of state. His first act was to withdraw the Free Wells League military from House Allison's territory. The strong alliance that had existed between the two families since the nation's founding more than five centuries ago was broken. The Capellan Stratagios immediately moved to take advantage of the political infighting within the League. Their shared border had been more or less static for over a decade by this point, but as soon as the FWLM departed, the Seacaf swept in to retake three of their lost worlds in September. They now prepared for an assault on the provincial capital. Davian's counteroffensive was still going strong in 2804, though progress had somewhat slowed. Between February and December, they liberated only two more systems, moving on another pair towards the end of the year. On the other fronts, exhaustion coupled with a lack of transports meant there was very little movement. In late December, a Capellan task force appeared within the Orient system and began moving towards the capital. Their objective was to spend a month on the ground, causing as much damage to the planet as they could, then withdraw before the Captain General could send in reinforcements. What little space defences Carter Allison had left were sent into action, alongside hastily conscripted civilian dropships. Their near suicidal actions, as well as fire from the anti-capital ship emplacements on the surface, did succeed in destroying a third of the raiders, but enough had made landfall to set ablaze several industrial sites and cities before Colonel Moretta called for a retreat off-world. At the time, the survivors of the raid believed that they had only just escaped before Marek could extract retribution, but the Mashkarovka soon realised that the only League redeployments that were taking place in the region were provincial forces moving within the Grand Duchy. The Captain General was far more interested in the Lyran Theatre, which he had been commanding since 2789. In March, he launched an attack on Bella, pushing the Donegal Guards back two months later. This was a key part of his strategy to draw the LCAF away from a crux as the FWLM prepared for a breakout. Ilsa Liao was shocked at how Thaddeus had left his ally out on a limb. With seemingly no help coming to House Allison, she moved to take Fujidera in April and liberated a pair of systems within the salient jutting into the Sana commonality, after which they prepared for a full invasion of Orient. Moretta returned to the enemy capital in June, leading many of the same units into battle. This time, they stayed well out of range of the surface emplacements, instead dispatching commando teams to bring them down so that their warships might move into firing positions overhead. Their plan quickly went awry when a blizzard developed over their intended targets, forcing the Liao colonel to rush all of his attacks. Most of the nuclear missile silos were eliminated, but it came at the cost of more than half of his aerospace fighters. With barely any air cover and visibility failing fast, any hope of victory the Capellans had deserted them when an artillery strike hit their command compound, killing Moretta. Through pure luck, Orient was given a reprieve when the invasion's second-in-command called for the withdrawal. In their anger at having failed to take the planet, the Liao Corvettes made an attack run on the major cities, bombarding the world before departing back to Confederation space. Millions of Orient citizens have been killed, and Carter Allison was forced to concede defeat. The capture of Fletcher in July made it clear that the Capellans would be returning to finish the job. He departed for Atreus to humbly beg for Thaddeus' help before a third attack on his homeworld could be launched. Davian's counteroffensive maintained their momentum throughout 2805, liberating two worlds between April and December, moving on to another three by the end of the year. Among their new targets were Elbar and Cartago, 
two planets that Minoru Kirita had hit in the opening month of the invasion. This next batch of systems was secured early in the following year. Word of Carter Allison's flight from his Grand Duchy reached Ilsa Liao and Thaddeus Maddock at the same time. Both began hurried preparations to move forces onto Orient. Predicting that the Duke surely intended to request aid, the Captain General sent a strike force from the Principality of Regulus, including units from the recently expanded Regulan Hussars, towards Fletcher and Fujidera, but diverted them when he received the news that a Capellan fleet had already arrived at Orient. After dispatching the meagre defences at the Zenith on September 18th, the Capellans made landfall on October 6th and promptly set about securing their priority targets. The battle for the capital city began in mid-November, just as the FWLM reinforcements were arriving. The three largest Matic warships jumped to a pilot point in orbit above the planet, directly on top of the Liao squadron. Despite their numbers advantage, the Confederation warships were short on tonnage and still bearing scars from the prior battles over Orient. All but one was destroyed at the cost of just a single League cruiser. With complete orbital supremacy established, the League task force began landing on December 18th. Four mech and 12 conventional regiments spread out across the planet's surface to secure industrial and military targets, then gathered together for the attack on the capital. The CCAF had dug in and were not above using tactical nukes to hold off an advance. Most of the city was ruined by the time the last survivors finally surrendered on January 7th. The victory at Orient revitalised the weary Free Wells League military. In March, they moved to reclaim four of the worlds Ilsa had taken in her path towards Orient, driving them off by year's end. Thaddeus' main focus remained the Lyran front, however, and so even before his counterattack against Liao began, he advanced on Radostov in February. The goal was to find the path of least resistance to connect the regiments stranded on Okrux with the rest of the realm. With only militia to defend it, Radostov belonged to Marek by May. But the League didn't have much cause to celebrate, as Haussteiner had already launched a counterattack on Bella one month earlier. This had been one of the Captain General's main objectives in the region, so to take it from him in just two months, only a year after his initial victory at Bella, was a major embarrassment. But the Lyran Commonwealth too could not celebrate. The Draconis Combine had been picking at the Commonwealth with frequent low-level raids, identifying targets for swift invasions. In the past five years, they had taken Al Nazal, Orbison, Buckminster and Vega, the latter two of which would become prefecture capitals in later decades. The cycle of disappointment continued around the Inner Sphere, though. They had failed to take Rio from the Capellans and continued to lose ground on their rimward flank. In the same February to May period that Marek took Radostov, the Federated Sons liberated Sholam and Corridon. With these victories, the Federated Sons finally took a five month break to move up reinforcements and supplies before moving again in November December time. 2807 saw the final moves of the Davian counteroffensive before they at long last ran out of energy. In January, they launched an assault on the Kiritan forces stationed at Evansville, Roe, and Sun Prairie, as well as against the CCAF occupiers at Castleton. They also set about crushing the pockets of DCMS resistance in their reclaimed territory. Both sides were heavily fatigued and the ever-decreasing number of jumpships made maintaining an offensive almost impossible. Paul Davian went so far as to issue specific orders to his naval forces not to destroy enemy jumpships unless unavoidable, a state of affairs that remains in place even today, centuries later. With the completion of these campaigns in June, a quiet settled over the Inner Sphere for the rest of the year. Thank you very much for watching guys. I'm sorry that this episode got delayed a week. I wish it could have been longer to make that long wait worth it. If you missed the community post I made about it, the reason it got delayed was because I mistakenly deleted some of the math files I needed. We're getting closer and closer to the end of this project now. Only four more episodes to go. The next one is the last of the longer 30 minute one. 
I, I should say now, there's a good chance that it won't be ready in time for next weekend. Uh, fixing the errors on the maps for this one was a relatively minor task, it only took about an hour. But there is nothing worse than having to force yourself to redo work you've already done. And what that essentially has meant is that this week I've just done no work on the project whatsoever. It's going to be a bit of a race to try and get the next one out for Saturday. Uh, if it looks as if it's going to be delayed another week, I'll make another community post about it. But after that, there's going to be three relatively short episodes, and I don't think any of them are going to be particularly time-consuming to make. So what I might end up doing is putting the two uh, final chapters out as a kind of two-part finale on a Saturday-Sunday at the end of November. The next chapter marks the beginning of what is sometimes referred to as the second phase of the war. By this point, all the factions are exhausted and barely able to maintain an offensive. They're still wanting to fight, wanting to wage war on each other, but they're finding it increasingly difficult to do so. So we're not quite at a point where ceasefires are being talked about yet, uh, but we're getting towards it. There isn't really a particular theme to the next one, though it will see the rise of one of the Inner Sphere's most dangerous organisations in ROM, but we'll get to that next time. It'll end up taking us up to, I think it's 2813, at which point the following chapter is going to focus on what's been going on in the periphery over the first 30 odd years of the war. We've hardly talked about the periphery at all during this series, uh, which was a deliberate choice on my part, they don't really play much of a part in the First Succession War, but they do have their own problems and battles going on in the background, so it's good to focus on them for a little bit uh, and see what's been unfolding. Thank you again for watching, if you've enjoyed the video please leave me a like and a comment, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this one, and if you want to help me you can support me on Patreon, or you can share the videos around with other people who you think might enjoy them. Thanks again, and I hope to see you again soon for the next chapter.